Well, today we're going to talk about a little bit of software design aids uh, for the specifier and the designer, uh, just some tools to hopefully make their job a little bit easier um, as we go through and they either either you're experienced with uh, the use of polyethylene pipe and different applications or you're a novice and a beginner. Um, they're great tools either way. Um, I use them all daily, weekly, monthly. Um, they just come in very handy. So we'll just jump through a few of those. Uh, we talked about the presenters today, myself, Alan Amblers, handling questions, and Richard Colossa. I wish I was up there. It looks a little bit nicer. Uh, yeah. um, so, so uh, pipe.org, which is a PE Alliance website, full of information. The other is uh, the Plastics Pipe Institute. That, that organization has been around for well, I think like 60 years now. So they have a long history of plastic piping experience and really their knowledge base is technical based, how to disseminate information. So they're at plasticpipe.org, PE Alliance is at pepipe.org. And both websites, as I said, are, are full of a lot of information under Plastics Pipe Institute, go to their publications page and you'll see a whole list of items there. Um, under resources for the PE Alliance, you'll see a lot of resources there as well. Um, a lot of case studies, uh, different engineering packages, things like that. So we talked about the case studies just a little bit. This is a great uh, library. So what PE Alliance has done a very good job at is collecting this information because nobody ever wants to be the first to try polyethylene for a certain application. And once you take a look at this list, you'll see, okay, there's pretty much nothing that hasn't been done with polyethylene in the past. Uh, it can handle a lot, lot of applications. In fact, we find that people educate themselves on polyethylene because what they're currently using doesn't work. They have a very difficult installation or something where they need additional um, capabilities. And they'll say, well, let's try polyethylene. They educate themselves on it, learn about it. And it's a great entrance into the use of this uh, of this material. So the case studies there will show you that you're not the first. Under the technical literature on the PPI website, there's just a lot of technical notes, as you can see, how to how to uh, tighten the bolts for PE flanges so you don't so you get, don't get any leakage. Um, how disinfectants affect polyethylene pipe and how you get a hundred plus year design life from that. Um, on pipe and tubing, TN49 as well, and how you guide, uh, guide off for squeeze offs and different things. And then on the technical report side is a little more detailed information, things that actually had a study done behind it, um, resistance to bacterial attack, uh, weatherability of polyethylene pipe, whether it's black or with uh, different uh, color pigments and UV stabilizers. As long as uh, also like directional drilling. I mean, uh, TN, TR46 is a great uh, guide for how you use mental, many horizontal directional drilling and placement of polyethylene pipe. So a lot of resources in both of those. Richard, you yeah, have a uh, comment? Yeah, I do. And just for everyone out there, I mean, here you've got these, uh, the Plastics Pipe Institute and the PE Alliance that are continually adding feedback and keeping these up to date and current. So you don't see a lot of dated um, items here, but they constantly grow. And plus we have a municipal advisory board within PPA or PPI that have a lot of uh, experience that, you know, deal with issues that we're, that are out there in the, in um, your environment that are causing you issues as well well so we're constantly keeping that up and we love to hear from you guys as well if you ever have anything just let me know and, and we'll be happy to to look into it and put a whole bunch of experience behind it to to make things happen that's a great point richard yep this is a, a years or decades of informational experience that goes into this so we're always looking for what are the other topics that are out there so great info thank you Okay, here we go. Um, the, we talked about all the experience that goes around with polyethylene pipe and the Plastics Pipe Institute, and it really is culminated in the handbook of polyethylene pipe. This is a, uh, I'd say probably a 20 year endeavor written by experts uh, in the polyethylene piping industry. Over the years, um, all this guidance and everything has been put together into one handbook. So it's uh, available on the, on the PPI website 
Each chapter is available for free download as a PDF, so you can peruse it at your leisure and whenever you need it. Or you can order the hardbound book for those of you guys that just like a hardbound book like I do, that you can thumb through still and put notes in. Um, you can order this, uh, this 16 chapter handbook, which covers pretty much every aspect of the use and installation and design of polyethylene pipe um, from PPI uh, for a very nominal fee, I think 50 or $60. So a great resource. Um, another thing that you should be familiar with is AWWA M55. That was republished, revised and republished to its second edition uh, just last year. Um, it has the latest information on designing with PE 4710 and how to take advantage of all the performance properties and attributes of this ma current material. Um, there's 11 chapters starting with all the engineering properties of the material. Chapter four, working pressure ratings, how you derive the pressure class. Remember, every material's pressure class is defined and derived differently. So just the way you do it for ductile iron and PVC, it's done different and it means something different for polyethylene. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, external loads chapter, chapter five, was revised by Amster Howard. His goal uh, in his semi-retirement has been to standardize how we talk about compaction of soils and selection of soils and, thing, and the different tests that we do. And so this is all the latest and greatest in that area. Highly recommend uh, anybody that has questions and just looking for information on that, a good chapter to look at. Joining, installation, maintenance repairs, and there's a lot of appendices as well, such as Appendix B, earthquake applications with polyethylene pipe. So the nice thing about that is there's a world of experience, years of experience in real world earthquakes showing how polyethylene pipe performs extremely well. So you don't have to have a special design or a special fitting or something else. The attributes of polyethylene make it work for that application. Richard. Yeah, I just want to do a shout out to Amster. I mean, if you've ever met the guy or the gentleman, he is unbelievable in terms of his knowledge and experience with uh, burying piping systems. And, um, I, you know, for me personally, when I first met him, it was uh, a real enlightening experience because there was things that I never even thought of. But he's an amazing individual, and I do strongly recommend. Uh, he's got a book out as well on, on pipeline systems. And if you're having issues, it's a great reference. So... Stephen, speaking of earthquakes, uh, what sort of special considerations do you need to make when you're uh, using polyethylene in a, in a seismic area? I know with PVC and ductile, you have to buy a different kind of that product. What is the case with polyethylene? Well, that's what's very interesting. And so with polyethylene, just its general P4710s we use today and using a heat fused restrained joint, the way polyethylene is joined, you really don't have to do anything special. That's the beauty of it. Um, and you don't have to go through special designs. There's real world application experience to show you that what we use today, how we design it today, the fittings and joining methods we have today give you this earthquake resilience in those type of soil shifting zones that you may have. And it doesn't have to be earthquakes as well. Anywhere you have soils that move, whether it's from drought conditions, or from flood conditions, or the, um, the changing going back and forth, um, hurricane situations that you might have down on some of the coast areas. Um, anytime you have something like that, polyethylene, its restrained joint system will give you that resiliency. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to do anything special. So let's jump into the uh, software. So, Drew, are we starting to lose Stephen, or is that just me? Yeah, we lost uh, we lost audio. Richard, do you want to take over here, and I'll put I'll put the slide deck up on on my machine. 
Yeah, no, I can I can see it I can see it fine. So these uh, these uh, technical software from the PPI, uh, the Plastics Pipe Institute, your S5 is really your calculator. And I encourage everyone on this webinar today to go look and play around with this thing. Um, I mean, it's got everything you need to know in terms of design. Um, the S1 Borade aid calculator is really going to be a great tool to help you understand whether or not you can conduct a uh, quick calculation on uh, a horizontal drill and um also the uh the um sorry drew i just lost it oh there we go uh the uh, pace the pace calculator is something that is used to compare the different products too so if you want to look at jobs comparing 100 year service life to polyethylene to pvc and to ductile iron there's some really good science and engineering behind that as well uh next slide please one of the amazing things about these tools is, is they are designed tools for civil engineers that are out there and anybody that's interested in, in, in the, the pipe product itself. So PPI has innovated in order to be able to make these available to you to be able to check the, the actual pipe in the applications that you need. So they, it, they're it, definitely an innovative design tool. Sorry to interject there. Richard. Yeah, no, that's good. But you're, you're absolutely right. So here, for example, is the is how you get into the S5 calculator, which you'll have some categories on the right hand side when you come into with pipe application installation, and the PE handbook, you first have to accept uh, the terms and conditions, because really, they want to make sure you understand what's going on. And so if you test uh, go into pipe applications and you want to look at pressure and you want to look at um, um, the different um, uh, velocities and volumes you just choose the size of pipe that you want to use at the top with the product that you're using and the dr uh, and then what you can put in is the length of your your line the temperature that you're going to operate and, and typically the average temperature is okay to use here um, if you constantly have a higher temperature above 80 fahrenheit then you can you can put in that higher temperature and that's fine it'll just compensate for the pressure and operation of it and it'll have all the criteria for how this is calculated and in these um, calculations you're going to see little boxes with arrows in them and once you calculate you can literally uh, scan over the top of that little box and it'll show you where that calculation comes it's like open PPI handbook uh, that'll open it directly to show you where that comes from so it's a really great tool and there are different areas of uh, where you want to go into uh, next slide please so when you look at the sourcing of material, that's what I was talking about, that little box. So there'll be these little squares with this arrow in there where you can literally take you right to the source of where this information uh, comes from. So then you'll understand exactly where this information was, was taken from. So in this particular case, when you look at all the temperature, the min wall thickness, the pipe wall and everything else, it's, it's all in there. So it's all taken into the science and engineering behind these calculations. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look at an application, so we could look at the application, either a pressure flow, the new aspect of this thing, because chlorine resistance was uh, an oxidative resistance was a big, big topic. Uh, and the MAB spent a lot of time and the whole industry spent a lot of time for polyethylene working on this. You'll see this oxidative resistance and it says new. So then you can go in and you can plug in your water systems conditions and operating con uh, uh, parameters. And you can actually look at, at the, um, uh, aspects of, of uh, flowability and how it'll manage it. So again, looking at pressure flow, uh, you know, with the DR that you're using and the pipe size and the length of the pipe that you have, you be, can determine what your gallons per minute are. And really, that's the key. And really why this is important, why we want engineers to go in and look at this is compare apples to apples. If you need a uh, 750 gallons per minute at the end of this line, then don't get all hung up about the ID of this pipe. Um, because polyethylene has again a higher resistance to velocity than most products out there uh, up to 25 feet per second so again when you look at the pressure flow calculation uh, you can either solve for frictional pressure loss or you can solve for the length of pipe or the flow rate and so whatever result you or data you put in the result will always be on the left hand side under the pressure flow as it's uh, determined by which you want to calculate so if you wanted to look at that frictional loss you could do it um, again example two 
Here's just a different size pipe where you're talking about a 47, 10, 12 inch DR11, uh, 8,500 foot line. Uh, you got an inlet pressure of 150 PSI and an outlet of 50 PSI. So your Delta P of course would be calculated to hundred PSI. And at what maximum flow rate, at what maximum velocity and what potential surge rates, you can all look at this and say, hey, well, do I meet or exceed what my polyethylene pipe can do? And again, polyethylene having a, um, a repetitive surge event of one and a half times the maximum operating pressure or an occasional of 2.0 uh, times the maximum operating pressure because of um, uh, it's, you know, and we define that by occasional being kind of an emergency or an, uh, not a regulated event or repetitive is pump on pump off on a regular basis. Next right, Stephen, are you, are you back with us? Uh, no, Drew, he's, uh, he's lost his internet. Oh, I see him. I think I, I think I'm back. Are you, can you see me? Yep. Yeah, I can okay. see you. I can hear you now too. Do you want to try pulling up your presentation? We'll give us a second a second shot here. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you just want to keep driving it. Yeah, yeah, no problem. That will yeah. give me a little bit of extra of, uh, capacity here maybe. Thanks, Richard. Okay, hey, no problem, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you live from the moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're getting better connection there than I am here. <laughs> So just to continue on with what Richard was saying, all right, so we go through this scenario, um, looking at, all right, what kind of flow rate are we going to get at this uh, 100 PSI pressure drop over, let's say, 8,500 feet of line? Um, so we have 100 PSI to work with, 8,500 feet. Well, you can see you're going to get a flow rate of as high as 3,700 gallons per minute out of this 12-inch DR17 product. Um, flow velocity is 11 and a half feet per second. Kind of seems high, but for polyethylene, that's really not an issue because really what you want to look at is the surge that's generated by that the potential surge. It could be generated by that is 130 PSI roughly. So you take the 150 plus 130 surge potential. You're still only you're still well below the repetitive surge allowance for the product of 300 PSI. So even 11 and a half feet per second for this flow rate is is a good design for polyethylene. It's a great thing to, um, it's a great advantage of this product to take it, uh, take into account and take advantage of. All right, I got a question for you. So I've been working with a city, Stephen, and I use the, you don't have to ID match argument on them. And because you don't, it's a system design and you can have varying um, IDs. And um, the PVC people, Stephen, right. love to say, you have to match ID because that would require us to go with a thick, with a larger um, outer diameter. But this, this gentleman said to me, Stephen, he said, in a gravity situation, I really do have to match ID because I won't get the same flow. Uh, and I could get a backup there and it could generate a problem in my system. Could you explain that to me? And is he right? And if he's not, help me understand how to argue that point. Oh, it looks like we lost Stephen. Alan. Oh, Stephen, you're there. No, we lost him. Richard, well, how about the, you? It, yeah, yeah, in the gravity. Alan, I, I'm coming in and out. Sorry. Go okay. ahead, guys. Um, so, yes, in a gravity application, um, you're going to want to get that largest uh, internal diameter possible because the only thing that's moving the flow in a gravity application becomes gravity, obviously. So, um, Oftentimes in stormwater systems, they want to try to maintain that ID as large as they possibly can. Uh, same thing with gravity. It's uh, gravity sewers. That's what's moving it along. Okay. All right. So he's right. And uh, that, is a, that is a time when we, don't, when we do have to ID match to keep the system operating properly. Thank you. All right. So um, Richard Colossa, let's bring you back. And uh, Drew, can you run the deck, please? Yeah, so again, here's a gravity situation where you know, you're gonna solve for your G, uh, GPM um, or your required slope. So you can calculate your flow rate based on that. So just make sure you take a look. And this is why we really encourage you to play around with this because you can either look at the hydraulic slope or you can look at the flow rate, whatever you wanna try to calculate for to see whether or not this pipeline system in a gravity situation um, will, uh, will accommodate your needs. And so for sewers and things like that, I know we're doing a lot of 
bursting with existing series of AC pipes, but um, you can see, you can actually pre-calculate what the sewer system, and if you've got, uh, you know, extended growth in your residential areas or whatever it may be, uh, you can look at that um, uh, capability and maybe you can upsize a little bit and, and increase that capacity. So very, very nice tool to work with, very easy to work with. And again, I really, really encourage you to, uh, to play around with it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, installation. Um, you know, we have, we always have discussions about installation and there's, you know, I've been doing this a long, long time and, and, and working with uh, people that um, are traditional in the way they do things, especially uh, for bell and spigot type systems. But we have an, un, you know, when we look at above ground installation, we have an un, unrestrained length change that you have to consider for. It's not that it's impossible to use, you just have to manage it and calculate for it. Uh, and what you're really calculating for is the maximum pulling force that's created by that differential in temperature, uh, whether it's expansion or contraction. Um, and then you can look at end anchor forces. So you can make sure that if, if that force, let's say, is somewhere between 20,000 pounds of load, uh, then you can anchor that system to restrain that, that, that load so you don't have any issues on a connection to a different uh, material. And again, if you had a situation where you had suspended pipe or you had a support span across a, a valley or or across a trench or whatever the case may be um, we have those calculations as well and we know how to to understand that uh, how the polyethylene would work for you in that situation uh, below ground uh, of course we need to look at pull forces we need to understand what this polyethylene pipe can do for you well, when you pull a pipe through a, a bursting situation or a horizontal drill and the beautiful thing about the bore aid it'll calculate those uh, forces for you and if they exceed uh, the uh, forces that are required then it'll it'll fail the pull um, thrust blocking sizes we can calculate those uh, trench widths you know trench widths digging up less dirt for polyethylene because we build everything above the ground you know we would have a span of let's say 800 feet from fire hydrant to fire hydrant or 300 feet whatever the case may be um, and you can build that above ground you don't need to build this great big uh, trench in there to to accommodate that polyethylene and we have uh, rules for that buckling pressures when you bury it uh, whether you have h20 loads or h80 loads for that matter uh, railway systems uh, earth loadings and also buoyancy when you come into marine applications so we truly understand how this product works and these tools are here for you to help you understand it as well uh, next slide please so above ground situation. So here's an unrestrained length change of expansion and contraction. So we can look at this length change. So if you had a hundred foot of pipe and you had a, a 10 degree uh, uh, a differential from 73 to, to 63, then you can say that, hey, we're gonna look at um, a, a negative one inch of contraction on that length of pipe of that 100 feet. But you can put whatever length you want in there. So um, if you're doing a sewer line or a gravity system, for example, and let's say it's it's 110 or 105 degrees out in Arizona and your pipe length is um, is you know uh, expanded because it's you put it together above ground and then you drop it into a trench that's 35 degrees cooler, then you can actually calculate what that what that shrinkage is going to be in that. So then you don't pull, uh, you have enough length from manhole to manhole in that situation. But we understand this situation completely. And it's not really a, a complicated thing It's just understanding what it'll do and what it won't do. And then usually when the system is buried, then then it stabilizes that temperature. Yes, Peter. So I've got a question about surge pressure. It when you're calculating surge pressure, is it just a simple equ um, equation based on velocity and dr, Richard? Uh, yes, yes, it is because because that's that's it's kind of a hoop stress resistance you're talking about an instantaneous type of event where let's say a valve slams open or slams shut uh, and then you create that surge for a short period of time so we that's how that's exactly how we calculate it. It Alan. does have an effect of um, material properties of the pipeline as well. So that, that's an important part of the equation itself. The bulk, mul the bulk modulus of the pipeline material has an effect. So one of the, one of the 
real applications with high density polyethylene when it comes to velocity changes uh, is the, the modulus of elasticity within the high density polyethylene pipe can absorb uh, those velocity changes significantly. Uh, in, in, so there's less uh, pressure drop across it through larger velocity changes. So it does change and vary um, with pipe material type as well, Peter. Yeah, and that and and you're absolutely right, Alan. And that's really important because looking at modulus, sometimes an, uh, the bigger number isn't always the best number in terms of that resistance for that uh, that surge event. So, um, okay, so below ground, uh, when we talk about pull forces and length, we have the uh, a section in here for slip lining, for example. Uh, you can you can um, calculate what those forces are on that uh, required for that length of pipe. So once you have your, and then also the time. Uh, so uh, Alan mentioned that the modulus uh, for the polyethylene is typically around 150,000 PSI for instantaneous, but let's say the pull takes two or three hours. Uh, so we can accommodate that. So there's a, you have to choose the proper time under tension. So we want to make sure that once we release that time or tension, that it will uh, relax to its normal state. But there are the loads associated with it uh, and also the lengths that you can pull. So if you have anything shorter than that, you can see that it's quite significant for an eight inch, uh, you know, 6,000 foot pull. We got 25,000 pounds of uh, restrained forces that we, we have to work with. Uh, buckling pressures, again, uh, this is either under uh, soil pressure or vacuum because you can create vacuum situations as well. But we can we can look at this uh, allowable buckling um, uh, force, uh, a PSI for pounds per square inch. So then you can calculate for, let's say, a 12 inch DR13.5 and you want it, the duration to last 50 years and you can put 100 years in there too, uh, which is great. You can look at what the ovality change is and the safety factors associated Seem to be having some some troubles here with uh, internet connections all, yeah. all yeah. down. So yeah, Alan, you're our last engineer, so please please <laughs> please connection. So so again, uh, what we're talking about is a a tool, a calculator tool that's available to you online and allows you to be able to enter in whatever parameters that you are working with uh, in order to be able to make these um, design decisions as to whether or not that again you. Nope. I, I wish it would work for Peter, uh, for, for Richard, but it doesn't seem to be doing so. So um, uh, here they could show you what the pressure rating is and whether or not it'll it'll stay within uh, the soil column as you you've designed and, and survived through that as well. So go ahead, advance the next line. <clears throat> so earth loading, um, it essentially calculating these loads is the same for any type of pipe that you might install, whether or not it be PVC ductile, uh, high density polyethylene, the, the pipeline material itself in a flexible pipe application, which is what this HDP is, as well as ductile and PVC, they're designed them to be able to transmit any type of forces to the soil surrounding it. So here, in we, when we're looking at earth loading, we get to look at um, uh, uh, H20 loads, which were really a rigid pavement above that. And an H20 is the vehicle design uh, that they're typically looking at to be able to, to install this under traffic. Uh, and you can choose several different parameters here in order to be able to, to work through the calculations. Um, the handbook on polyethylene pipe also shows you those calculations as well if you have very specific scenarios to, to take a look at. So here, this is going to look at uh, vertical deflection um, and a percentage of that pipeline as well. It'll tell you all the results and all of the equations that give you uh, that information to begin with. So um, as, as um, cautious and conscientious engineers that, that we are, um, we definitely need to check through all of these. Again, they're just tools online, but they give you exactly where the resources come from within the Plastic Pipe Institute Holly Handbook on Polyethylene Pipe and allow you to be able to double check all of those uh, yourself. Yes, Peter. Alan, to that point, you know, some of these, and come on, Stephen, and, and talk about this. I'm, Stephen, I know you've, you're working on your internet, but um, Alan, part of, part of some of these softwares don't permit the user to 
change every variable. In some cases, PPI has made them fixed. Is that correct? Uh, in some specialty applications, the one that I'm most aware of is, is um, uh, hydrocarbon permeation through uh, the pipe wall thickness itself. So a, an analysis of what would be typically seen in a, um, a brownfield um, associate, you know, most often associated uh, with with gas stations throughout the United States, I believe was modeled as the primary um, uh, concentrations of benzene in that that calculator. But that's an extremely specific situation um, for an environmental design that has to be considered. So as civil engineers, we would look at other alternatives than installing any type of pipeline in a known contaminated hazardous brownfield. Got it. Steven. Yeah, Steven, you're, you're mute. Yeah, no, he's, Steven, we, we don't have your audio. So Alan, keep going. Mm -hmm. um, Please proceed. Guys, sorry about the technical today, but we're still charging on. Some, sometimes it happens. So um, uh, the MAB has created a series of new inspection forms uh, to be used while inspecting any number of, of uh, fusion uh, or high density polyethylene related installations. So here you're seeing the list of, of different inspection forms available to you for the construction engineering inspector on the job site to be able to complete and make sure that we had a, a viable record for it. Um, so the data logger is something that can help with butt fusion inspection as well. Um, and these inspection forms uh, then advance electrofusion. So you got to make sure that you follow the correct steps uh, to perform a successful electrofusion and it would be included uh, here in this form to be able to mark down on. Next line. Hey, Richard, Alan. do we have you back? Oh, Stephen, all right, yeah, perfect. Back? Hey, yeah, just to jump in there real fast. Uh, hey, thank you for all that. Sorry, I think I got my buttons fixed. So, <laughs> um, uh, so like an, Alan was talking about the inspection form. So this is like the first one that's on there, incoming material inspection form. So, I mean, this is a great tool because most people don't realize that, hey, when I get pipe on a job site, I got to look at something. Is it what I ordered? Is it, you know, for the right project? Is it the right size, the right specification? And this just gives you a nice, simple checklist for things I should be looking for. Um, you know, what spec was it manufactured to? Uh, what type of testing did it do? Does it have the right print line and identification on it? Is it at the right OD and pressure class that I need? Um, if you're going to be doing any field measurements, though, so if you're going to go out there looking at OD and wall thickness for minimum wall, um, make sure you have the right tools. It's not real simple. Uh, remember that the requirements and specifications for tolerances on OD wall thicknesses are all set at 73 degrees. So if you're outside in the sun and the pipes at you know, 100, 120 degrees Fahrenheit uh, because it's absorbing some heat energy, um, those dimensions are gonna be a little bit bigger than if it's, conversely, if you're in the cold, same thing. So you wanna check on that to make sure it's okay. But remember uh, when you're looking at that, um, that you have to make sure you're using the right tools. You can't just throw a yardstick on there or a tape measure. Um, it's really not the appropriate way to do it. It's very difficult, but this is a good tool for what do I need to do when I get material into the field to make sure I got what I really needed. Next. So we'll jump into the second piece of software, which is the PPI Borade. So this was developed by Professor Mark Knight at the University of Waterloo up in Canada, and he's kind of a, an expert in this area. So what he and his, um, his staff did up there was develop a general, what I'll call a first look directional drill guide for polyethylene pipe. In fact, he did such a great job that Vermeer bought the license for this. They had him add a whole lot more bells and whistles to it and things that they like it. But this version of it, which is the scaled down version is for free, uh, can be used at ppiborade.com and you can go through for a first look. Next slide. So it's very simple to use. Uh, you use the slide buttons and you'll pick your nominal diameter um, for the polyethylene pipe. In this case, we'll just pick something big like 36 inch. And then we're gonna uh, use the other slide button for the dimension ratio that you have. And you'll pick DR11. And then you'll go to step two. 
On step two, it's going to show you a generalized layout of the bore path, starting at you know L1, L2, L3, L4 for the different lengths of the job. So you can put in different parameters here. Uh, project length, what's my overall length that I'm going to need? Um, pipe entry angle, pipe exit angle. You know what? Not everybody knows what those numbers should be. And so as we talked about earlier, I think Peter was alluding to this, there's only certain ranges that you're allowed to put in here. So if you want a pipe entry angle of 45 degrees, it's going to say, ah, sorry, you can't do that um, because the drill string you're using won't be able to, to bend like that. So it's only going to let you pick certain angle ranges that actually make sense for a, a directional drill job. What's your depth of cover you have over the pipe? What's the water table, soil thickness? What extra length do I want coming out of the end of the pipe? And then it's going to do some calculated values there on the left hand side. Sometimes it might give you an error. If you don't pick the right length that's going to work for the depth you want to go and the angles that you're using, you're going to have to pick a longer length of pipe. So it's kind of an iterative type step. And you'll go back through and you'll see, all right, here's the total length of pipe I need for a, for a job like this. And then you want to see, okay, does 36 inch um, DR11 or DR13.5 really work for this application? Well, for that, you'll go through and you'll hit step three. So step three will give you the table of calculations. And you can see on the left-hand side, you're going to have these three yellow orange boxes um, as different, um, I guess, criteria of how you're, how you're installing this. So first is the most simple. It's going to say whether you have ballast and rollers. The second option is going to be uh, rollers, but no ballast. And then the third option or the third bank is going to be you have rollers and ballast, all to minimize and give you different uh, characteristics of the pipe string and pullback forces. So you can see very clearly graphically uh, what works and what doesn't work. You can see on the very top three lines. So what they're going to do is give you the DR you chose, DR11, and then they give you the next thicker wall DR and the next thinner wall DR just to give you a comparison to see, do I really need that heavy a pipe for whatever reason? Um, in this case, you can see that DR11 works fine in this application with no rollers and no ballast, but DR13.5 doesn't. And here's why, because you get collapse, potentially uh, critical collapse pressure short term and longer term. Um, pull force is not a problem, but overall the design fails. As you go down the list, you see if I, well, what if I use rollers? Well, still pullback force isn't your issue, so rollers aren't going to help. So you still have the uh, potential for collapse. But let's say you add ballast to that now. Oop, go back one more. Let's say you add ballast to that now. Not only does DR11 work, but DR13.5 could work also. So that could work for your collapse and your pullback force and possibly use a thinner DR pipe for the same application. You know, there's a lot of different scenarios. And what this does is just lets you go back and forth very quickly to pick which one might work well for you. Again, it's not an overall design, but it's a great initial first look. Next. Lastly, I want to talk about PPI Pace. Now, this is a uh, piece of software, again, developed by Professor Mark Knight and his team up there, that gives you a direct real-world comparison on three, um, I'd say, primary materials in the waterworks industry, polyethylene, PVC, and ductile iron. So as you go through this, you hit get started, PACE, Pipeline Analysis and Calculation Environment. It's a good acronym everybody can remember. Next slide. So as I said, what it's going to do is let you look at polyethylene, P4710, ductile iron, and PVC pipe, uh, all under the same operating and design conditions. This will give you a real world um, comparison to see, all right, am I going to get the right type of design life I'm looking for for this product. So let's just pick a length. Let's say I have a thousand foot length I want to do. Uh, could be whatever you need. And then it's going to ask you for what's your design velocity for recurring surge and your design velocity for occasional surge. So kind of your average and your maximum design criteria you need to uh, design with. Um, now this is going to be one of those areas where again, you don't have to know what the best thing is. It's going to let you pick, it's going to pre, um, I guess, uh, populate these areas with what is the most common criteria and only going to let you put in things that make sense. So let's say a working pressure of 70 PSI. 
uh, recurring surges, 55 surges per day, which is pretty common uh, for a force main application and for other applications. You think, well, that's kind of high, but we'll see in a minute why it's not. Average uh, installed operating temperature underground, below ground, 57 degrees, and you want a minimum of 100 year design life. You should never ask and never settle for anything less than 100 year design life based on all major failure criteria the pipe is likely to see. Next step. So we talked about, okay, well, recurring surge four feet per second. Well, that seems like over design, some people would say. Well, it's really not. So if you click on the little button there on each, uh, each entry, uh, it'll take you to where that uh, criteria go uh, is from. Next slide. So you can see once you click on that, the sources of information to give you that are different design reports, different standards, uh, utility specifications that are out there, and force main specifications that are out there. So it's a survey of, of a lot of different sources that show that four feet per second is not unusual. Some go up to six, even seven feet per second as a requirement for uh, occasional or recurring surges. So four feet per second, while some people may say, oh, it's really only two, four feet is real world. And that's where you should be designing for. Next. The other is anticipating surges per day. Like I said, you can go through each one of these, but if you click on the, the radial dot uh, for information on re anticipated surges per day, 55, next slide, it'll take you to the source of information for that. Again, you can see 55 is the minimum but there's a lot of specifications that actually require even higher than that, a larger number of surge cycles per day. So if you're looking to design for surge, you got to take that into account. And you can click on each one of these uh, boxes and just see um, where that information came from. Again, it's from real world, real design situations. Speaking of surge, not to get too far afield from pace, Stephen, um, I've heard you say before that polyethylene does not suffer from fatigue issues caused by surge, yet you know PVC does. I mean, it's one of the primary ways that PVC will die. Uh, tell us about how you know that and what, what's the scientific backdrop for that statement? Yeah, good question, Peter. So there's been, um, you can't just say it, right? You need to have data, you need something to back that up. So there was a very large uh, research project that was done. It's been published, you can look up the information in the report that shows after tens of millions of cycles of going full amplitude surge pressure, polyethylene doesn't fail. In fact, that pipe was tested after 10 million cycles, 10 million plus cycles at full amplitude um, surge events and it's still tested just fine as the day it was made. So it's not going to deteriorate. It's not going to suffer from cyclic fatigue, which will eventually cause failure. Um, for other products like PVC that are prone to cyclic fatigue, you have to take that into account. Um, if you design with it properly, you can, you can um, mitigate that, but you have to make sure you use that as one of your design criteria. So yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, we're, we're on fourth generation polyethylene. Um, UKWIR, which is the UK's version of AWWA or the Water Research Foundation, Stephen, last fall published a paper that on first generation polyethylene that had been in the ground for 50 years, it tested new. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's that's where we're, we're coming up to that level now where, um, you know, polyethylene pipes been in the ground for 50, 60 plus years. And this is first generation, as you were talking about. Polyethylene hasn't stood still. We're on our fourth generation of improved material of this, of this product. Whereas, you know, other products have been around. They say, oh, we've been around for 50 years. Well, they've been the same for 50 years. So there really isn't anything new except in the way they try to protect them and, and, and uh, design properly with their specific characteristics. So you really need to take a look at all of this and show you know, where is the information I'm coming from? What am I taking into account? What am I not taking into account and should? And this piece of software really gets you to take a look at that and start thinking along those lines. So once you have all the information, the actual operating conditions put into this uh, PACE software, you can click on step two and it'll take you to the output. So this is a table of values um, for polyethylene, ductile iron and PVC. 
and it'll tell you, you know, all the parameters that you picked, you know, what's the pressure class rating of each one. And you can see here that pressure class is not the full story. This is a pressure class 125, PC 125 polyethylene pipe, a pressure class 350 ductile iron pipe, and a pressure class 235 PVC pipe. So pressure class is not your basis you need to design with. That's a starting point, and it means different for each product. So you can go down and uh, take a look at the inputs. Let's go back, yeah, real quick. Um, and you can see on, okay, what kind of a flow rate am I getting? Are they comparable? Well, you can see that they are when you design and pick the right products. Head loss is the same. Surge pressures. So you can see the surge pressure generated by this uh, instantaneous flow being stopped is different for every material because it's based on the modulus of the material. The higher the modulus, the more surge pressure is generated by that sudden change in velocity. And so you have to take that into account on what's my total pressure, operating pressure plus surge. And you can see that for ductile iron on occasional surge, you've run out of that 100 PSI buffer that they give. And for uh, PVC though, you're still okay. You're still within the operating range. But Originally, Stephen, the ductile iron people tell you they have the strongest pipe. So why is that an issue for them? They do have a very strong pipe, but that's why you need a PC350 to operate at 70 PSI. Um, because the, you need this uh, surge protection in the background. So yeah, I mean, steel is strong, right? Iron is strong product, but strength is not everything. Strength doesn't always mean tough. And that's where you get with polyethylene. It may not be the strongest, but it's definitely the toughest. Richard. Yeah, one of the things, one of the things that's important here too, uh, Stephen, as well. I mean, you look at this 125. I mean, I know that the water utilities are really focusing around DR11 for extra safety factor, uh, but just trust trust these calculations uh, when you do use them to say this is the minimum that I can use, and then you can truly build in whatever safety factor you want. Um, for for uh, both Stephen and I, both being pipe manufacturers, you know, we'll make DR11s all day long. But, but really, really to try to truly understand what this product can do for you for the longevity of the, of the pipeline system, um, it's really important though, so you get comfortable with it because it is kind of discomforting to say, hey, well, how come such a thin polyethylene can do such a great job? Well, it's that ability to uh, maintain its ductility over long periods of time and really resist those surge events as well. So Alan, question for you. Uh, as a PE, is your recommendation as a professional that engineers should use this through schematic design, then do their own details uh, for the final drawing set? At what point is this appropriate? It depends on the situation and scenario. So um, for most typical operating pressures that we'll see within a pipeline, um, the industry itself has adopted a DR11 for water use, um, and, and that's immaterial from from actual operating pressure because most uh, systems operate between 55 and 70 psi uh, they've done done a higher pressure rating for extra ultra conservancy uh, but some of these calculators that we're looking at um, with specific detail um, when you have a a installation such as borate or a horizontal directional drill it, it's very important to go through the actual process, uh, ASTM standards of horizontal directional drill calculations to back that up. Uh, so th those are the installations that that um, you know a competent engineer would go through and 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 check all the calculations in order to be able to validate the design. Uh, just typical operating pressure systems with that extra conservancy on top of of a, a, a heavy duty pipe. Um, of giving you the, the the resistance to occasional and recurring recurring surge um, is a routine thing. Um, we also know that within proven standards that that this pipe does what it says by all the testing and at the manufacturing level. So that gives us a whole lot of confidence that uh, the, the pipe material is doing what it needs to be doing. Awesome. Thank you. Back to you, Stephen. Yeah, that's a good. That's a very good point. I mean, both Richard and Alan brought up the point of you know you can use the PC-125 polyethylene as far as design goes, it works fine. If you want a little bit more robustness to maybe handle uh, more rigors of installation and just give you a greater margin of confidence and margin of safety around your designs, 
course you can go with a heavier wall pipe and see that it's going to be just fine. Um, so there's are a lot of different ways to tackle this and make sure that you're getting uh, what you're going to need for your particular situation. And, and lastly, though, you saw that it can handle all materials. Well, the PVC even handles the surge events just fine in this case. Um, but where it lacks is in, is in fatigue again. So you go through the cyclic fatigue, 55 cycles per day for 100 years, it won't do it because you're maxing out the fatigue life of that product well, well below 50 years. Now, is there a way to do it? You're going to say, well, this just shows everything fails but polyethylene, right? No, that's certainly not the case. Go next slide. Well, wait, you said 50 years. It's actually 58 is 58 yeah sorry right. and there's a margin of, uh, there's safety margin built into all of this peter you're right um 58 years instead of 100 um but you really i mean today there's re no reason to go for any less than a 100 year design based on all potential failure mechanisms not just pressure not just fatigue not just corrosion but you got to take a look at all of them and design against every way that product likely to fail and the lowest common denominator, lowest, lowest denominator for that product should still be in excess of 100 years. So this slide just shows you the same information graphically, um, just to see what works and what doesn't. And then let's say, all right, let's start back at the beginning. Let's go back and say, all right, everything's going to be the same, except now I'm going to use a DR14 PVC product. So as far as pressure class is concerned, you're jumping up there now to a PC305. So if you go back and take a look at the same operating conditions, four feet per second, eight feet per second, same, same pressure rating, same cyclic fatigue or same cycles per day, and you go to step two, now you see that the material works because of the surge capacity that I built into and the additional fatigue built into the DR14 PC 305 or a DR14, which a lot of municipalities uh, require because of this, does give you now a 100 year fatigue design life because it gives you that extra margin of safety. So there's a lot of different ways to skin it, um, a lot of different things that are going to work for your particular application, but the PACE software is just a very um, unique tool to give you that side-by-side -side, apples for apples comparison without the smoke and mirrors of all the different types of uh, guides you may have and see out there. Yeah, good job, Stephen. Um, Stephen, is that the end of your deck? Um, pretty much, yep. So I had a couple questions. Um, uh, we've, we've said that uh, we're gonna go to 75 minutes. It kind of depends on how many more questions we get, um, Richard and Stephen. But Stephen, I've got one for you and Richard chime in if you'd like. Uh, you know, this, this talk was called PPI software for the specifier and designer. Well, there's a, there's, there's a formula and a study out there, Stephen, that PPI did in answer to some premature polyethylene failures. And our competition loves to hit us on these guys. And what, what had happened was in some earlier generations of polyethylene pipe that weren't designed the same way, we saw some premature failures. Now, Stephen, mm -hmm. you mentioned that uh, we are continuing to evolve polyethylene. As it relates to chlorine, what was the circumstance that caused this failure and what did we do about it? Yeah, that's exactly right, Peter. So as I mentioned before, you know, we're on our fourth generation of polyethylene. So what does that mean? With each generation, what we tried to do was to attack that um, potential failure mechanism and try to extend that try to improve the performance along that particular type of mechanism. So when the first generation of polyethylenes that were installed in the 70s, maybe 60s, 70s, early 80s, um, when those products um, started to have some failures and we started to look at that, there was a combination of two things. First of all, they were being attacked by some very aggressive oxidizers in the system. So chlorine is very commonly used but it's used differently in a lot of different situations. And what we found is chlorine chemistry, as people who have studied that, is very, very complicated. There's a lot of different things chlorine does, uh, depending on the type of water, the pH of the water, the um, everything that goes in together for the, to calculate what's called the oxidative reduction potential or ORP of that particular fluid um, you know, residual chlorine, depending on how much they have in there, how long it needs to last before it gets to the end of their system, 
all of that plays a part. So what PPI did over a multi-year study and probably several million dollars worth of testing came up with a solution for that. Said, all right, why is this attacking polyethylene and what can we do to stop it? And there was a, and that was published in PPI um, TN44, I believe it is, that shows the chlorine categorization ratings now for the product. So we, two things that were done, the molecular architecture of the polyethylene was improved to give you what's better, what's what we term slow crack growth or this type of stress intensification that may occur if there's a defect or a, or a brittlement of some, of some type at the surface, will that generate into a crack and will it grow through? Well, we've improved that by tens of time or hundreds of times better, if not thousands of times better um, than our current or previous generations of polyethylene. And we also have a stabilizer package in there now, which protects it over the long term, um, over this 100 year time frame. So between the two, we truly have a 100 year design now against that. So all the failures you're talking about that were very extreme situations, very high ORP numbers, very high operating temperatures, normally most of them were surface, uh, not surface, but service lines. Service lines aren't buried as deep. They're very shallow. They don't have the rigor and design that goes into them. And they were um, in situations where the ORP or the, the aggressiveness of the water was very high. And so we have a system now for designing against that. Yeah, we do. Richard, go ahead. No, I'm good. I'm sorry. I just lost connection again. I don't know why, but I'm okay. all good now. Alan, you wanted to comment? Absolutely. Um, um, and that's very good. Uh, summary of the situation. Um, one of my things that I really enjoy the most about uh, the PE pipe industry is that innovation, is identifying a problem and making it better. So um, for those of us in the water field that are on the line here, the, the um, severe scenarios as to which Stephen was talking about were, were isolated to um, service connections in hot weather. Uh, high chlorine areas, and then also chlorine dioxide in particular, which is a chlorine mm. um, uh, gaseous thing uh, that goes through. And it's a very heavy, heavy oxidizer that's used in treatment processes. Um, typically, most systems use a, 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 a bleach or a liquid chlorine uh, or chloramine. Uh, that's a blended um, a weaker uh, oxidant that lasts a bit longer in itself. So uh, most polyethylene operated in those scenarios never has an issue um, and with the, the temperature range as well. So um, these were very specific problems that the industry overcame and made the overall base of all of the product offerings significantly better for you. So I've always been very pleased about how you've innovated uh, and changed the product material over time. Uh, PVC and, and ductile iron hasn't changed uh, uh, very much since their inception as well. So um, it's, it's good to recognize the, the failure mechanisms and innovate uh, to solve them. Yeah, which, which we have done. I'd also like to add to what Steven said to our audience that PPI also came out with guidance on the issue of service lines. Uh, so two inches and below the standard now is DR9. So we're seeing a very thick wall for those high residual chlorine, um, high temperature situations. Um, one additional uh, question I have, and we'll let our audience go here. Um, but there's uh, Paradise, California recently announced that they're going to use polyethylene uh, for their service lines as they rebuild their community. Stephen, there's been some press that's been uh, published that talks about how polyethylene burns and causes VOCs in the soil and it contaminates the water. Can you give us a little background on that and talk to us about how that is indeed not the fact? Yeah, so when the when the camp fires happened in Paradise, as you talked about, a tra terrible tragedy that pretty much you know destroyed the town. Um, they found that in their remaining drinking water system, there were higher levels of some VOCs. They're going, well, where did this come from? And there was um, some indication, well, an indication, I would say, speculation that well, it must have come from the plastic. That must have been it happened. The plastic melted and and deposited these VOCs in our water. And that, that must've been the culprit. 
Well, in truth, what really happened is we found that in, in these intense fire applications, and it happens all over, not just in this one area. Um, normally, it comes from different things, such as wood combusting and the, and the chemicals that go into preserving and treating lumber and things like that, and can come from a lot of different sources. So it, it came from not the plastic in the system, because there wasn't a whole lot, first of all, out there. It came from other sources. That's been well-determined and well-established. And, and so it really is a fallacy. And I think that it, um, it proves the point that Paradise has now chosen polyethylene to go back with as the most economical and long-term fix to that problem. Yeah, good explanation. Alan Ambler. Um, yes, another, another uh, terrible situation um, that put the, any distribution system at its, at its maximum um, uh, operating scenario. So with multiple fires and multiple locations, you can imagine that the, the use for fire demand was, was massive, which is the single scenario that really tests the, the potable water system at its max. So um, while they're operating and fighting fires in one side of the town, the infrastructure was completely eliminated on the other and created a vacuum um, that sucked uh, foreign material that had melted and done other things into the pipeline itself. So that was another aspect of this that comes from pushing a pipe network to its its absolute maximum in operating scenarios. We don't simply just blame the pipe. That's not a real world, you know, uh, part of the situation. We have to really look at what happened from an operation standpoint. And after we an analyze that, we fully understand it makes logical sense that, that none of that was intended to be a, a operating scenario. Guys, I appreciate your uh, finishing up by talking about some of the downsides and some of the arguments we hear about HDPE and its use in the real world marketplace. I'd like to invite Madi Harup back online um, and say thank you to our audience for participating today, certainly in Madi. Uh, Thank you for uh, sponsoring this episode of the Roadshow Light Program today. Yeah, thank you. It's a lot of information, but great information. And just remind you that um, we at CCOR, you know, work hand in hand with PE Alliance, and PPI, uh, these technical resource engineers from WL and Pipeline that are here. Um, you can you can look us up online, um, CCORonline.com, and get our contacts. Um, Enlist our aid if you have any projects. We'll, we'll work with these guys and bring them along um, on uh, anything for your projects. And again, just thank you so much for your time and look forward to talking to you guys again.